Hello, this is Robert Beverly at the Naval Postgraduate School. Today's lecture is on GSM. This is an introductory, introductory lecture for CS4538. So what is GSM? GSM stands for the Global System for Mobile Communications. It's really a family of mobile communication technologies. It's evolved over time. Here we see that GSM has been around since the 1990s, but has evolved into what are known as 3G and 4G technologies, such as UMTS and LTE. UMTS is the Universal Mobile Telecommunications System, and LTE is the Long-Term Evolution. GSM is known as a 2G technology and was the first digital telephony, mobile telephony technology to come onto the market. But all of these are related in many different ways. In particular, all of them are standardized through th the 3GPP, or Third Generation Partnership Project. Today, there are more than 7.5 billion users in 219 countries that use some form of these technologies. This constitutes more than 90% of the global market. Looking at the technology adoption, what we see is that GSM is still used quite prevalently. Here, this is data from 2016, we see that there are 3.2 billion subscribers that use GSM, whereas LTE only has 1.7 billion subscriptions. If we look at the distribution of technologies among different markets, we see that North America leads the world in LTE market share, but other parts of the world, for instance Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, have very little LTE penetration. Which brings us to GSM in 2017. Why are we talking about GSM, a 1990s technology, in 2017? Well, there's several different reasons. First of all, GSM is still used Today, there are 3.2 billion users, and many areas of the world still use second-generation GSM, in particular the Middle East and Africa. Second, all of these different networking technologies have steadily evolved, and so understanding how GSM works will help us in understanding how the 3G and 4G technologies work. In homework number two, you'll get a chance to dig into some of the details of 3G and 4G. And third, because there really is no flag day, meaning a single day when all of the technology switches from one technology to a newer technology, all of the devices and infrastructure that we'll consider are backward compatible. And this has a very striking <coughs> implication of downgrade attacks. What this means is that many times it will be possible to tell a particular device to downgrade to a backward compatible version of a protocol. So if there's a weakness, for instance, in GSM, we can convince a phone to use GSM in many cases and then exploit that device. So let's return to talking about GSM. GSM has, from its inception, several different primary security concerns. And we can look at these from the perspective of an operator or the perspective of a customer. From the operator's perspective, we would like to ensure that the correct entity is billed. We'd like to avoid fraud, and we'd like to protect our services and infrastructure. You can see here that these are very much related to the business's concerns. From a customer's perspective, the customer wants privacy, so they don't want people being able to intercept their communication and snoop and listen in. And secondly, they wish to have anonymity. And this goes back to some of the issues we talked about with RFID and tracking. We wish to ensure when we, make, uh, when we carry a mobile phone that <clears throat> unwanted entities don't have the ability to track our movements. So the high-level security goals of GSM were originally to make the system at least as secure as the public switched telephony network. This should sound very familiar. When we talked about WEP, we saw that we wanted to make it at least as secure as a wired network. Here we're trying to make it at least as secure as the PSTN. GSM wishes to provide confidentiality and anonymity on the radio path. Here, I'm emphasizing the radio path portion because there is no end-to-end -end privacy. 
In fact, what we're going to see is that the confidentiality is simply on that first hop between the mobile station and the base station. We'd like to provide strong client authentication to protect the operator against billing fraud, and we'd like to permit roaming, whereby <coughs> allowing users and subscribers of a particular service provider to be able to use other operators without compromising each other's security. We also have some security mechanism requirements. GSM must not add significant overhead on call setup. It must not increase the bandwidth of the channel. It must not increase the error rate. And it must not add expensive complexity to the system. Further, it must be cost effective. These different security mechanism requirements are going to drive some of the choices of technology and protocols used. So the security features in GSM include the following. First of all, there was a desire to have the key management be independent of the equipment. The idea here is that subscribers can change their handsets without compromising security. Second, we'd like to provide subscriber identity protection. We want it to be difficult to identify the user of the system simply by intercepting the data that's passively available on the radio channel. We'd like to detect compromised equipment. We want a system to tell whether or not a mobile device has been compromised or not, or stolen or not, or otherwise is an abused device. We would like to have subscriber authentication. So we want the operator to know for billing purposes exactly who is using the system. And finally, we wish to provide signaling and user data protection. So we want the signaling and data channels to be protected and be confidential over the radio path. When we talk about that interface between the radio and the base station, we're usually talking about the UM interface. This is the GSM radios interface. There are 14 different frequency bands that are defined by the 3GPP. Practically, most of the world uses one of three different uh, frequency bands, either the GSM 900, the GSM 1800, or the GSM 1900. GSM is a technology that uses both TDMA and FDMA technologies for multiplexing. Recall, TDMA is a time division multiplexing algorithm, whereas FDMA is a frequency division multiplexing algorithm. GSM 900 has 25 megahertz uplink and 25 megahertz downlink bandwidth. One of the things we'll see in GSM is that there are going to be separate radio channels for the uplink traffic versus the downlink traffic. <clears throat> Each of these 25 megahertz frequencies is divided using FDMA into 124 carrier frequencies. Each of these carrier frequencies is 200 kilohertz and each base station gets a few of these. Finally, each of these uh, carrier frequencies is divided using TDMA, or time slotting. Each uh, frame is comprised of eight different time slots, and each frame is 114 bits. So when we talk about the physical channel in GSM, we're talking about the time slot. But we'll often talk about the logical channel, and this is the information that is going over the physical channel. Both user data and signaling are logical channels. User data is carried on a traffic channel, or a TCH, which is actually one of these multi-frames, one of these 26 TDMA frames. There are also control channels for signaling. For instance, the base station signals to the mobile, and the mobile can signal to the base station. For instance, we'll do this to request network access, to negotiate different channels, so on and so forth. Here is a summary of the different kinds of channels. You don't need to look at these in too much detail, and in fact, we're going to consider them in much more detail in homework number two when we examine a Wireshark capture of GSM traffic. Again, the TCH is the traffic control channel that contains the user data and the user voice. In addition, the CCH is the common control channel. And here we see that there are 
other channels within the CCH, such as the broadcast control channel. These are used to allow base stations to do things like announcing their presence. This is very similar to Wi-Fi beacons that we saw when we studied 802.11. Here what we'll see is that different base stations will advertise the different frequencies that they can use. Here we'll also use some of these control channels to do things like paging the mobile phone to let it know that it has an incoming call or an incoming text. Next we see a picture of the high-level GSM architecture. There's a couple of different large-scale components in here. All the way at the left we see the mobile stations or MS. The mobile stations is simply a fancy word for saying these are the mobile phones or the mobile devices. These are connected over the radio interface to the base station subsystem. The base station subsystem is comprised of two different components. One is the BTS, or the base transceiver station, and the other is the base station controller, or BSC. We'll look at these in more detail in a bit. The BSCs are attached to something called an MSC, or the Mobile Switching Center. This is the heart and brains of the GSM network. The Mobile Switching Center is, has different parts to it, some of the parts are the VLR, uh, which is the visitor location register, the HLR, which is going to be the home location register, and the EIR, which is going to be used to maintain data about the equipment. So the MSC has complete knowledge of the subscriber and terminal equipment. We'll talk about these in more detail in a moment. It's also useful to point out that the encryption on the radio channel is going to be between the mobile stations and the BSS. So here we'll see that there's no end-to-end -end encryption. Let's dive into the mobile stations or the MSs a bit more. The mobile stations have a couple of different identifiers that we're going to be interested in. First of all, each mobile phone is uniquely identified by something called an IMEI or an International Mobile Equipment Identity. The subscriber, which is a different identifier, is identified by something called a SIM, or the Subscriber Identity Module. The mobile phone here is independent of the subscriber. You may have done this yourself, where you've taken your SIM out of one phone and put it into a different phone. The IMEI uniquely identifies a mobile station. It's a decimal number, decimal number that consists of 15 digits. Here's a picture of a Huawei phone and its IMEI. The 15 digits <coughs> have uh, what's called a TAC, or the model ratification code. This is six digits, the first six digits. Then we have the factory assembling code, or two digits, a sequence code, and then a reserved one digit. In addition to the IMEI, we have something called an IMSI which is the International Mobile Subscriber Information. The IMSI is a 64-bit field, or 15 digits. It identifies a unique international universal number of a mobile subscriber. It consists of three main fields, an MCC, an MNC, and an MSIN. The MCC is the country code of the subscriber. The MNC is the network code. These are both three digits each, and the MSIN is the subscriber identification. We'll see that the MZ of the user is actually written into the SIM card, and then further is stored on the HLR, or the Home Location Register. Recall that the mobile stations communicate with the base station subsystems, and in particular, they speak over the radio channel with the BTS. The BTS is the base transceiver station. I've got pictures of two of them here. They may be obvious, such as the one on the left, which you can tell is a radio tower, or less obvious, my favorite, is the trees, which disguise the radio tower. The BTS houses the radio transceivers of the cell, and they handle all the radio link protocols, such as the modulation and demodulation. The BSC, or the base station controller, manages the radio resources, such as channel setup and handover, and, there may be <coughs> and it may do this for one or more BTSs. 
In the heart of the system is the Mobile Switching Center, or the MSC. This is similar to the idea of a telephony switch, plus everything that's required for a mobile subscriber, such as the registration, the authentication, handovers, call routing, connection to fixed networks, etc. And each of these switches will handle actually many dozens of cells. The MSS has four different components. We'll talk about these in a bit more detail as we go through the authentication and roaming processes. The first is the HLR, or the Home Location Register. This is a database of all users and their current location. There's one of these per network. Then there's the VLR. This is the Visitor Location Register, and this is a database of all users and also users that are roaming in some geographic area. Recall that we would like to permit <coughs> subscribers from a different network to use our network. The VLR caches the information in the HLR. Next, there's the Equipment Identity Registry. This is a database of valid equipment. And then finally, we're going to have something called the Authentication Center, or the AUC. This is going to be a database of all of the user's secret keys that we'll use for authentication and for confidentiality. It's worth noting that operators are very concerned about fraud. One way that we deal with fraud concerns is to detect <coughs> compromised equipment. The IMEI is used to identify stolen or compromised equipment. The IMEIs of stolen or compromised devices can be stored in something called the Equipment Identity Register, or the EIR, where there is a blacklist of stolen mobile devices, there's a whitelist of valid mobiles, and then there's a gray list. In addition, operators also maintain something called a Central Equipment Identity Register. <clears throat> Here, these, this contains approved mobile types uh, that are uh, approved by the local authorities and also contains a consolidated blacklist so that one phone that's been stolen can't be used on another operator's network. We talked about the IMSI, or IMSI, which is the permanent identifier of a subscriber. The IMSI, in fact, is used as infrequently as possible. The idea here is similar to what we saw when we talked about tracking and privacy concerns of consumers in RFID. Instead of sending the IMSI, what GSM does is it uses something called a TIMSI, or a temporary mobile subscriber identity. The TIMSI is used instead of the IMSI as a temporary subscriber identifier. The idea here is to prevent an eavesdropper from identifying or tracking the subscriber. So how is the TIMSI used? It's assigned when the IMSI is transmitted to the AUC on the first time the phone switches on. Every time a location updates, for instance, moving to a new MSC, the network assigns a new TIMSI. The TIMSI is used by the mobile station to report to the network or during call initialization. Further, in the other direction, the network will use the TIMSI to page and communicate with the mobile station. Again, following this theme of trying to use the IMSI as infrequently as possible, even when the mobile station, the phone, is switched off, the TIMSI is stored on the SIM card so that it can be used when the phone switches back on without having to transmit an IMSI. The VLR performs the assignment, administration, and update of the TIMSI. Next, let's talk about the SIM. SIM, you'll recall, stands for the Subscriber Identity Module. This is really just a smart card that contains keys, identifiers, and algorithms. There's a couple identifiers that are stored on this phone. The first is the IMSI, as we've talked about. The second is the TIMSI. And then what we'll concern ourselves with from here on is something called the K underscore I. This is the subscriber authentication key. So this key is a symmetric key crypto key. 
Again, we're in a world of using a shared key where there is some trusted out-of-band channel for doing the key distribution. Here, the key is programmed onto the SIM by your service provider. So the service provider generates the key, they put it into their database, and then they program it onto the SIM card, and then give it to you along with the phone, maybe via email or by visiting, not by email, by visiting by postal mail or by visiting an actual store. So what is this key? This is a 128-bit key, and it's going to be used for both authentication and for doing confidentiality or encryption. This key is stored on the subscriber's SIM, and it's stored in the HLR of the subscriber's home network. I'm going to emphasize that it's only stored on the subscriber's home network. We'll see how that matters during roaming. Again, the SIM can be used with different equipment because the SIM identifies the subscriber, not the phone. GSM's authentication goals include <clears throat> authenticating the holder of the SIM card, protecting the network against unauthorized use, and creating a session key. Recall, we've talked about how we would like to have per session or derived or temporal keys. And we talked at great length why we wanted to do this in Wi-Fi and in WPA and WPA2 in particular. The authentication scheme will consist of sending the subscriber identification, either the IMZ or more often the TIMZ, and then performing the challenge response based authentication of the subscriber by the operator. One of the things we'll see here is that GSM is only providing one-way authentication and is not providing mutual authentication. Again, we've seen this in other systems. The assumption here being that the GSM operator and base station is trusted. In terms of the authentication and encryption, there are <clears throat> three different algorithms that we see in play here. One is called A3, one is called A8, and one is called A5. We'll discuss each of these in some detail. But it's good to know that the operator is, and the mobile station are going to implement both <clears throat> on both sides these three algorithms. Here we see that the SIM contains the shared symmetric key, KI, this is the 128-bit subscriber key, and the GSM operator is assumed to have the same key. The first thing that happens over the radio link is the GSM operator sends a random challenge. This is a 128-bit challenge. This goes into A3, which in combination with KI, the key, is used to produce something called an SRES, or a signed response. This is the authentication procedure. The SRES is sent over the radio link to the GSM operator, and the GSM operator compares the SRES against what the signed response should be. Assuming that this user is authenticated, the next thing that happens is the derivation of the session key. On this picture, it's labeled as K underscore C. To generate the session key, a different algorithm is used called A8. A8 takes the inputs of the SRES and the shared key, KI, to produce this session key, KC. Again, both sides will do this procedure to derive the session key. Now what happens is that the session key is used to encrypt the data. A5 is a stream cipher. We've seen examples of stream ciphers in the past. For instance, when we saw the use of RC5 in uh, WPA and WEP. Again, what we see here is that with the stream cipher, we have something that's very similar to the initialization vector, or the IV. Here, this is labeled F underscore N, or frame number. 
In this way, A5 produces a different key stream for each different frame. Let's talk about how each of the parts of the MSC provide authentication. The AUC, or Authentication Center, provides the parameters for authentication and encryption, so it provides a three-tuple of the RAND, the SRES, and the session key KC. The Home Location Register provides the MSC with this three-tuple and handles the uh, mobile station location. Then the Visitor Location Register will store these generated triplets, and this is useful when a subscriber is not in his home network or her home network. If you look at the authentication scheme again, what needs to happen from the perspective of what does the GSM operator need to both authenticate and encrypt the data? Well, the GSM operator needs the RAND, the SRES, and the session key, or the KC. In this way, what can happen is that the home network can give to the visiting network this three-tuple of the RAND, the SRES, and the session key without revealing the shared secret key, KI, of the actual user. Again, this helps uh, enable roaming without revealing subscriber keys from one operator to another. Let's look at each of these different algorithms in more detail, the A3, the A8, and the A5. So A3 is the mobile station authentication algorithm. Its goal is the generation of the signed response to the random challenge, the 128-bit 128 challenge. Here it takes as input the random challenge, the subscriber key, the KI, each of which are 128 bits, and produces the signed response of 32 bits. The next is A8, which is the <coughs> encryption key generation algorithm. It generates a session key using <coughs> uh, the, random, the random number, which generated the SRES, and the subscriber key, and then generates KC, or the session key, which is 64 bits. It's useful to note that A3 and A8 are simply logical implementations. Both A3 and A8 are implemented on the SIM, and the operator can decide which algorithm to use for doing A3 and A8. In this fashion, the algorithm's implementation is independent of hardware manufacturers and network operators or at least that was the idea. In reality, an algorithm known as COMP128 is used for both A3 and A8 in most GSM networks. One of the more depressing parts about COMP128 is that this is a yet another example of security through obscurity. The algorithm was confidential and was not published in any way we'll see that it was actually reverse engineered quite some time ago. So what is COMP128? COMP128 is a keyed hash function. It takes the 128-bit random, the 128-bit uh, subscriber key, and generates 128-bit um, output that includes the SRES of 32 bits and the session key, which is supposed to be 64 bits, but it turns out when this was reverse engineered, they discovered that KC in the implementation of COMP128 only has 54 bits of entropy, and 10 of those bits are actually zeroed out. Finally, let's talk about A5. If you'll recall, A5 is the encryption algorithm. This is done after the authentication and is used <coughs> to protect the contents of the data. A5 is a stream cipher, and it was designed to be very effective on hardware. And again, it was never made public. It was simply security through obscurity. Some of the implementation of A5 was leaked to Ross Anderson and Bruce Schneier. There's three versions of A5. One is A51, 
This is known as the strong version. Then there's A52, or the weak version. A52 was intentionally created to be weak and was used for international markets and to try to avoid some of the laws and regulations regarding strong crypto at the time. We're going to consider A52 completely broken, and in the next lecture, we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about A51 and how even the strong version was reverse engineered and broken. Finally, there's A53. A53 is a publicly based algorithm. So instead of doing the security through obscurity, the GSM Association Security Group and the 3GPP designed it based on something known as the Kasumi algorithm. A53 is used in third generation mobile systems such as UMTS. So how does the A5 stream cipher work? Well, recall how we looked at stream ciphers in other systems such as Wi-Fi. What happens is each bit of actual data is XORed with the output of the stream cipher. So we call the output of the stream cipher the key stream, and the key stream gets XORed with the data. This produces the ciphertext. Recall that we're, <coughs> that we're actually encrypting 114-bit frames. For each frame, there's a frame number, which is 22 bits. This is analogous to the initialization vector that we saw previously. The initialization vector here is used to ensure that we don't have the same key stream for every single frame that we send. A5 again takes the frame number or initialization vector and the session key or KC to produce its keystream. On the other end, for instance, at the BTS, it does the same thing. So recall that one of the properties of a stream cipher is that you generate the same keystream on both ends and simply perform the XOR. So it's its own inverse. We're going to cover <coughs> several different attacks on GSM and talk about how we can go about trying to compromise GSM security. But it's useful to get a sense of some of the attack history. In 1991, the first GSM implementation came to the market. It wasn't until April 1998 that <coughs> the Smart Card Developer Association, in conjunction with some UC Berkeley researchers, successfully reverse engineered the COP128 algorithm and discovered that KC the session key uses only 54 bits. They then went on to develop an attack against COMP128 to recover the actual subscriber key, or KI. This permitted all sorts of interesting attacks, such as the ability to spoof and copy devices or subscriber identities. In August of 1999, the week a52 was cracked using a single PC within only a few seconds. And then shortly after, in December of 1999, three researchers uh, published the scheme to break strong A51 encryption. What they saw was that it was a trade-off. And within two minutes of intercepted call, the attack time was only one second. In May of 2002, IBM Research discovered new ways to extract keys from the COMP128 using side channels. And then in more modern history, in 2008, a black hat group of researchers were able to generate rainbow tables using FPGAs to generate <coughs> rainbow tables that could attack A51 efficiently. In 2010, the USERP came to market, we'll talk about the USERP or the Universal Software Radio SDR, was used in conjunction with rainbow tables to break GSM conversations in real time. Again, this was a black hat conversation. In 2013, Goldie presented some various attacks on GSM that attacked availability, and it was effectively a DOS attack against the GSM network. And then in 2014, came the introduction of something called MZ Catcher Catchers, which are fun devices that try to detect whether there are other devices in the network that are trying to 
induce our phones to reveal their persistent identifier or their IMSI or IMSI. We'll talk about these four attacks in some detail in the coming lecture.